Well, grateful to God for giving us opportunity to praise his name and to worship him, to stand before him today. Uh, one of the lines that captured my attention most today was that he knows the hearts of man, and yet he still loves, still moved towards us, still eager to redeem us. So grateful for that kind of love. If you're like me and you read headlines and you hear stories of fallen leaders, it breaks your heart. Uh, leaders who fail morally, who have gone outside the perimeter of Scripture and chosen a way other than the way of Christ, one that has brought reproach to the name of Christ and his church, his family, himself, uh, my heart grieves. And in those moments, I often will stop and just pray, Lord, please be gracious to me, a sinner made to be a saint in Jesus Christ, whose flesh would go the same direction if it weren't for the restrain restraining power of your Holy Spirit. Guard me, protect me. Uh, I want to be a leader who finishes strong. I don't know how many years uh, the Lord will give me, but I want to be one who finishes strong. And I'm encouraged that so many of you are thinking in the same direction. Malachi chapter 2 gives us direction over some men, about some men who did not think that way. And the Lord is going to take the blessings of spiritual leaders, priests, and he is going to turn them to curses. I'm grateful when I say those words that I can reflect genuinely on Christ who has taken the curse of sin upon himself. And God's wrath poured out on his beloved son for the sins of mankind without a single drop left to be received from any of us who have faith in Jesus. So grateful for that good news. But let's dive into this section of scripture of Malachi chapter 2 verse 1 through 9 because at this point in life uh, the scripture uh, tells us that Christ had not yet come and bore the, the weight of God's judgment. And so these men are going to experience that in full. Verse 1 of chapter 2, and now O priest this command is for you. I mean he's singling them out. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. Now, I'm not going to just uh, pull that out, but just for a moment to say it was the purposes of the priest to offer to the Lord what he required of them and the sacrificial parts of the animals that were to be burned on the altar. What was left was to be taken outside, was to be taken outside the, the temple, outside the city, and put in the wasteland, if you will including all the digestive systems of the animals. So here he's saying not only will that be removed, but it will be on you and you too will be removed. This is a, a threat that he is going to uh, move toward. And so you shall know that I have sent this command to you that my covenant with Levi might stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity, for the lips of the priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. 
You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And I will make you despised and abased before all the people, insomuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Let me identify some things that really stood out as I was diving deep into this text. And the first is this, that God commands leaders to honor and glorify his name. God demands that. He was demanding that of the priest in the day of Malachi, and he is demanding that of leaders today. Now, today's passage might seem harsh. It might seem harsh that God is so serious about his name, particularly the glory, the truth, the uh, covenants that are associated with his name. He demands those who minister to take his name seriously. And God demands that priests who minister before him and before the people teach his word to the congregation and live righteously before them, guiding the people well. And Malachi, in the day of Malachi, those priests failed to do exactly what God was demanding of them. They did not love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind because they failed to understand, as we found in chapter 1, God's love. If you don't understand God's love, you will neglect his honor and glory. It's the basis. Understanding his love moves us to understand the depth of honor and glory that we ought to constantly give to him. Now, this summer, as we preach through these four chapters of Malachi, you are going to recall this overarching, we'll call it a banner, if you will, of I love you you'll find that overarching banner over all four chapters. And every text that we're reading, you need to start with that. God said from the very beginning of this oracle given to Malachi, I have loved you. And the people question that. Now, how have you loved us? We've gone through that. But throughout the text, we're going to find that to be the basis of our understanding of the text, God's love. You see, the depth of, of the, the people who understand his love, they have a greater propensity to give him glory, to live gloriously to him. And when they question his love, when they doubt his love, then they probably are not going to live honorably or gloriously unto him. Now, some might challenge, as we read through Malachi chapter 2, God's love. They might say, well, how is it that God is loving? How is it that his heart is given in love when he is going to bring curses upon the people? And the readers may question, does God really love them? Does God really love those who he's bringing curses upon who are sinful to him? And the same question is being asked by many around the world today. It, it goes in a little bit different way. It says something like, if God is so loving, why would he send anybody to hell? If God is so loving, why would he present curses? Why would he issue them on people? But God is a just God, and he demands that what people have broken in the law is going to receive justice. You need to also recognize that God is loving, fully loving, and he offers to those who have broken his law the way of redemption. He, he's offering to them freedom and forgiveness in Christ. I don't think justice and love are mutually exclusive. In, fine, we, in, in fact, we find them perfectly aligned together in God. He is altogether just and he is altogether loving. And in God's justice, people are convicted and condemned to hell. And in his love, he offers forgiveness and righteous imputation. That is the righteousness of God given to us, imputed in us by Christ Jesus for all who repent and believe in him. So God is altogether just, requiring that justice be served. And at the same time, he is altogether loving, offering the way of forgiveness and freedom in Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? It's just the, the wonder of our God. So people who often focus only on God's justice often fail to see the fullness of his love in that he is offering to them salvation through Jesus Christ, who is the redeemer and the justifier. So in today's passage, we see a powerful two-letter word. 
And it is the basis of this offering of grace to these priests who have failed so miserably. And it is the word if. Damnation is a reality for mankind, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God offers good news if people will repent and believe in him. So in Malachi's warning here in chapter 2, verse 2, he warns them of curses, those who are unfaithful priests, but in love, he makes it conditional by saying, if you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, then I will send curses upon you. That little word, conditional word, if, is the measure of God's love. In other words, you are fully, you are fully um, to receive these curses, but if you will turn, I will not send them. He is requiring justice and he is offering to them mercy and his love. So at the basis of this, we find we ought to give honor to God's name. Give honor to God's name. That's where he first brings accusation against these men. I'm using honor and glory collectively. I'm using them interchangeably, if you will, because we really don't have a great word in the English to describe this word in the Hebrew language called kabod. Uh, in, in the language of the Bible, that word kabod uh, deals with the heaviness. It deals with the weightiness, the, the grand essence, if you will, of God. It is the weightiness of God's splendor, his grandeur, his majesty, his power, his word, and everything that sums up his name. When, when you sense the name of God and the, the heaviness of the name of God, it is that in that moment you are honoring him, revering him, and giving him glory. And remember, God's name is far more than just something that's uh, given as a proper name. It is the essence of who he is. It is his person, his character, his reputation, his doctrine, his ethical instruction. It's everything that we know about God. So the priests were to sense the immensity of God in their lives and then live that expressly by following his commands. Instead, they despised his name and did their ministry jobs in a half-hearted way with bad attitudes. Uh, there's a couple of women that I absolutely love in this church who serve this church and have for faithful a uh, number of faithful years. Uh, one is named Sabrina and the other is named Sheila, and they help keep all this property just in pristine shape. Uh, all the buildings are cared for by them along with Ricky, and uh, oftentimes I'll stop and just thank them and encourage them for what they do to make this place look like we serve and honor the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And they remind me that they're not doing this as a job. They do this as a ministry. They see this as an expression of their worship, the way they are honoring and glorying in God as they clean and as they prepare and they ready for the service unto the Lord for, that's coming up and whatever the next opportunity is for the people of God to gather in this place and all around this property. They are seeing it in that way. Now, look, if you and I would do our work unto the glory of God as God requires us to do so, then even our jobs become an expression of worship. They become an expression of our service. As you and I are engaging people in community, if we will do it to the honor and the glory of God, in other words, we are representing his name and his truth and his relationship that we have with him. If we interact with him in that way, then we are giving him honor and glory that is due his name. It's not just when we're coming into a holy convocational moment, a gathering of the congregation, and we're, we're giving him his due and honor and glory, but in every expression in life, we ought to be doing that. And if we will, if we'll embrace that and allow the Spirit to work within us those kind of truths, then God will do wondrous things in our life and all around our life, and we will see what he is doing. Now, the repercussions of leaders not giving glory and honor to the name of the Lord is that God brings curses on their blessings. Now, the blessings may be the blessings of the Levite covenant that God had established with Levi and his descendants, giving them opportunity to be faithful in their obedience to him. And in doing so, he would bless them. It was a covenantal blessing on the priest. 
But the Lord says here that I will bring curses on your blessings. In other words, what I offered to you in the covenant, in the Levitical covenant of priesthood, I am now going to turn that into curses. And it could be, as some commentators would say, it could be that the words expressed by the priest in the day of Malachi, that their very words of blessings over the people were actually going to be turned to curses by God. It could be one of those two, or it could be, as I think, both of them. It's a a rebuke. And he says these curses against them will be in the offspring. Now here again, a little bit of a controversy from commentators, Bible scholars. This could be a generational curse on their descendants, their offsprings, but that word is seed, and it could also actually be the crops, which God had warned Israel about all this time, that if if you'll walk with me and you'll serve me and you'll worship me alone, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you the fertility of the land. It's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. But if you choose not to do that, you go after other gods and you don't obey my commands, then I'm going to do the opposite. So here again, I think it's a combination of both, a generational curse and also a curse that comes upon the land. And that makes sense because even now, all of creation is groaning under the burden of mankind, longing for the day that God is going to redeem the bodies of people. The heaviness of sin, the weightedness of our sin affects creation and all the calamities that come from that. So none of us are Levitical priests. So you might be saying, well, why in the world are we talking about this, Randy? Why are we reading through this? Because every part of Scripture is pointing to Jesus and the fulfillment that he offers to us. And every part of Scripture is honing us by the Spirit, honing us to be the people that God has called us to be. You may not be priests, but I can tell you there are spiritual leaders in this room. Not just pastors and ministers, but I'm talking about life group leaders and deacons and leadership team members and all sorts of people that are leading in various ways in this church. There are moms and dads and grandparents in this room, which makes all of us leaders, spiritual leaders, because you're spiritual people. God has made you spiritually alive in Christ Jesus if your faith is given to him. So all of us are people that God calls to share his word and teach his word. Isn't that what a priest does? He hears the word of God and he delivers the word of God. All of us have been given the word of God and now we are told to share the word of God, to make the word of God known so that the name of Christ might be known. In a way, each of us has priestly duties. We're called to speak on God's behalf. And we're called to speak to God on behalf of other people. You say, what are you talking about? Well, speaking to God on behalf of other people can be just rooted down to intercessory prayer. You're taking uh, the needs, the prayerful needs of others, and you are interceding for them. That's what a priest would do. And you're taking the word of God, which is given to us in the pages of the Bible, and you are communicating them. Just constantly talking to others about God's word. So we all have these priestly duties. And if you're still kind of scratching your head to that notion, Randy, I don't know about that. Me being a priest, let me remind you what 1 Peter talks about in chapter 2, verse 9. Saying to the church, you are a chosen people. Say that next part out loud. A royal priesthood. Oh my goodness, the Lord sees you as priests. You've been brought in by Christ Jesus to be a royal priesthood that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that's giving honor to the name of God by having the name of God, by having the word of God and being that which God has called us to be. Chosen people, royal priesthood, making known the excellencies of Christ our Lord. Now look, making known the excellencies of our Lord Helping people to discover that we were once in a kingdom of darkness, now brought into a kingdom of light. All that is to bring honor and glory to him. We ought to be talking about that all the time. The goodness of God. The excellencies of Christ Jesus. That that ought to be flush in our mouth, just constantly coming from us. 
Now, our beliefs, attitudes, and actions matter. And if anything that Malachi is saying, that's one of the big things that he's saying. Our beliefs, our attitudes, and our actions matter. We must honor the Lord in word and deed, which means that we must revere him. We must fear him, sensing the weightiness of his splendor and his glory and his power and the truthfulness of his word, the eternality of his word. We need to know that, feel that, and uh, carry that with us at all times. Listen, when you're flipping through social media, when you're scanning through the internet, when you're uh, uh, perusing through the, the entertainment that's available to you today, you need to know the weightiness of God. You and I need to know that our beliefs, attitudes, and our actions matter in that moment. And when we're dialoguing with people, we need to know that the weightiness of God is with us. So God is not something that we merely add to our lives. He is our life. He is our living. And nothing compares to him. So when the world attempts to lure us away and our flesh beckons us to feast on desires that are not that of God, then we dare not take our eyes off the Lord. We dare not yield our hearts to what is offensive to him and its holiness. Why? Because we understand the weightiness of what it is to be walking with Christ, to be a son or a daughter of of our God. So we stand firm, empowered by his spirit to reflect the Lord's heart and to represent him in our words and our actions. Now, what motivates us to live that way? It won't be anything other than the essence of knowing the love of God. That's the motivation, that God loves us, that God has come to us in our sin, and he has redeemed us. He has brought us into a love relationship. He is our loving father, the adoptive father that has brought us into his eternal family. And in in that moment, it's God is extending his mercy and grace to us, allowing us this moment to be a life reset for those times that we have not honored him and thought of him in in grand ways when when our words don't match his words and our actions are not like his and some of you might be saying oh randy that's me i have not lived in a way that is honorable to the lord though people don't know it i am not honorable at all times before the lord i've got great news for you christ has come to make that difference Christ has come to change that, to offer you in his love a reset, if you will. Here's what 1 John 1, 9 reminds us of, that if we would confess our sins, God would prove to be faithful and just and forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's, that's a moment in love that we just say, God, thank you for your love I'm going to agree with you that that I'm in many ways like those priests of the day of Malachi. I have not honored you. I have not gloried in you. My words, my, my thoughts, my attitudes, my actions have not aligned in a way that is honorable and glorious. I have not fully ex- experience the weightiness and know the weightiness of you in my life and and thereby that has not permeated every aspect of my being I don't see my job as any of anything other than a way to make a living I don't see it as a way to bring honor and glory to you I, I see your word as something I catch on Sunday morning but I don't see it in my conversation throughout the day here's what God is doing in his love he's saying hit the reset right now how do I hit the reset you confess those sins to him For he is faithful and just. He will forgive and he will cleanse you of all that unrighteousness. And by his spirit, he will bring a reset attitude in your heart. And he will allow you to walk in a different way. That's what he was offering to the priest in Malachi's day. So God's covenant with priestly Leaders offers life and peace. I think that's what he's offering to us as well. Life and peace. We, we, we have life and peace available in Christ Jesus. Look at Malachi again, chapter 2, verse 5. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. I gave it. I gave it to them. The Levitical covenant mentioned here by Malachi is carried 
uh, mutual responsibility. On God's part, the responsibility was to provide for them life and peace. And the priest's responsibility, Levi and those who were descendants of him, including Aaron and others, theirs was to be fearful to the Lord, revere the Lord, which would bring with it obedience and honor and glory and all those things that reverence brings. I found it interesting in Numbers 25 that God used that same expression, a covenant of peace with a man uh, who is a priest, a descendant of Aaron, actually his grandson. Israel was living just north of Moab in a place called Shittim. Now, how would you like to live in that place? <laughs> I'm sure the language was very different back then and didn't have quite the offensive sound that it does now. But the Israelites began to defile themselves by having sexual relations with those who were living down south of them in Moab. The Moabite women were evil along with their men. They served other gods, multiple gods. Baal of Peor was one. And as the Israelite men went outside the perimeter that God had established for them in his word, and they said, nah, you know, we just want to engage in these kind of physical activities with other people. And they were literally bringing the women into the camp. And not just having that physical act of intimacy, but worshiping their gods as well, worshiping the God of Baal Peor, namely. And in that sinfulness, God's anger burned hot against the people. Now that's an expression that means he's bringing destruction. He's about to execute a number of them. And the Lord instructed Moses, I want you to sing, seize all the ringleaders and I want you to execute them in broad daylight so that my anger that is burning hot against the people of Israel might be suppressed. And just as Moses was ordering the people of Israel to do just that, just that in comes a man to the camp with a Moabite woman and goes right into his tent to begin uh, acting out in sinful ways. And up jumps a man by the name of Eleazar. He's the grandson of Aaron. And he takes a spear in his hand and he goes in the tent after the man. And he spears the man through the back into the belly of the woman. Executing them both right on the spot. And in that moment the plague that God had brought against Israel stopped. But not before 24,000 people died. Now listen to the way God summarizes that. And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. Now we think of jealousy in the negative terms, but God is jealous for his people, the people he loves. He, he he requires them to only serve him. And he has identified them to be the ones to have and receive his love. So in, that, in, in God's way, jealousy is a positive thing. So here's this man, Phineas, son of Eleazar, who says uh, in his heart, I have a jealousy for God. And so God says, now he's had my jealousy. I will not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, behold... I give to him my covenant of peace and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. In other words, in that moment of obedience, God would atone, would cover over the sins of those that was so blatant. Phineas's attitude is very different than those of the priest in the days of Malachi. The days of Malachi, the priests were just flippant. Uh, they, they knew God's word, but uh, no big deal. Uh, they, they knew that God was to be honored and glorified. No big deal. They allowed maimed, lame, sick, blind animals to be brought in the sacrifices. Just half-hearted worship not given to the things that God was given to. And they were completely opposite. In other words, the priests in Malachi's day had no fear of God, no reverence for God. They didn't honor him and they didn't glory in him. 
Now let's continue reading in Malachi chapter 2, verse 5, the latter part of that, the responsibilities of the priest. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. I gave it to him. And it was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. Now, if you're one to mark in your Bible, I am. If you're like me, you'll just see all those things that God has described about spiritual leaders what he would require. Here, here's what he saw in Levi. Here's what he saw in Aaron. And here's what he saw in faithful spiritual leaders, priests in the day. And you just begin to identify those things. Then you lift those truths before the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I want in my life. Not just as a pastor, not just as a Bible teacher, certainly as a pastor, certainly as a Bible teacher, but as a leader, as one who has friends who talks about the things of God with them, is one who has children and grandchildren who talks about the things of the Lord and the Word of God. Whatever the disposition is that God has given us to be influencers to other people, I want to elevate these things in my life because I view myself as a priest. I'm a part of the royal priesthood of Christ. And here are those things. They feared God. They stand in awe of his name. They speak true instruction, not uttering what was wrong. They walk with God in peace and uprightness, and they turn people from sin. That's what God would require of us. That's what God longs for us. If, if you're a leader, this is what God is calling. If you're a pastor, a minister in this church, this is what God would say to us, that he would want these things elevated and empowers us by his Holy Spirit to do that. But beyond the ministers, the pastors, the leaders of this church, I'm talking about deacons, leadership teams. I'm talking about life group leaders moms and dads and grandparents, disciplers, anybody that has a significant impact in this church in a way to elevate others, lift others, disciple others. If you're a leader in some way, these are the things God is calling for you. Fear him, stand in awe of his name, be truthful in your instruction at all time, walk in walking away with peace with God and uprightness and turn people from sin. That's what he would require of us. That's what he does require of us. And that's what he's going to hold us accountable to. So life and peace are not only for leaders, though. They are available for everyone. This isn't just about the, the priest in Malachi's day or the leaders in this day. I'm talking about it's available for everyone. For Christ came to give us life and peace. He is life and he says, I give you life. He is peace and he says, I give you my peace. Let your heart not be troubled. When you read the epistles, they often start by the Apostle Paul saying something like, grace and peace to you. The grace and peace that comes from Christ. So he's just constantly reflecting back on those truths. That's what God has given to us. And now the Spirit makes it so that we might have provision at all times in Christ to walk with life and peace. Look at Romans chapter 8. It's on the screen. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is what? Life and peace. So, okay, Lord, the world is wanting me to set my attention and my affection on it. I am a person of the Spirit because of Christ the Lord. I set my attention on the things of the Spirit that I might walk in life and peace that Christ has already given to me. Listen, just because he has given it to you doesn't mean that you're necessarily walking in it. So choose to walk in the grace and the peace, the life that Christ has already afforded to you empowering you in the spirit you're going to have to make a choice i'm going to choose not to dwell on things of the flesh i'm going to choose by the spirit to dwell on things of the spirit and in that we walk with life and peace all right here here's the final thing that i wanted to elevate to us god requires spiritual leaders to have holy lips and righteous living holy lips 
and righteous living. Verse 7, for the lips of the priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. So as messengers of the Lord of hosts, we must have holy lips and righteous living. Now you and I teach every moment we are awake. Let that truth sink for a minute. You and I teach every moment we're awake. And we're either doing it with lips or living. You can't get get out of it. You say, well, I'm not a teacher. No, no, no. You are teaching every moment you're awake. Preachers and teachers, life group leaders, Bible teachers, they're communicating lessons with words and with living. You're teaching with words and you're illustrating the teaching with your living. Moms and dads, you are teaching your children with words and with the illustration of your living. And those two have to match up. If, if they're not matching up, then, then you're not teaching in a way that is truthful. And kids, kids will spot that in a heartbeat. They know hypocrisy better than anybody. As you get older, you kind of brush past hypocrisy because many times we try to live it out ourselves. But kids will call you out, won't they? So you're teaching with your words and you're expressing those, those teachings with your life. In fact, you can tell your kids so you're blue in the face to do this or don't do that. But if they catch you not doing this or doing that, they're going to hear those expressions of your life far more than they're going to hear the expressions of your words. You're teaching at all times that you're awake. We communicate to each other, and when we're doing so, we are teaching about what it is like to be a follower of Christ. You're, you're sharing with others, this is what it's like to be a follower of Christ, whether it's your friends, your family, your coworkers, your classmates, your neighbors, whoever it is. Everybody is learning from you what it is to be a Christian. Are you teaching the right things? Students, you are teaching everyone in your school. Not just your classmates, you're teaching the faculty, you're teaching the administration. This is what it's like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You're doing that with your words and you are doing that with your actions. They are watching to see what it's like to be somebody who says they're in love with Jesus. We're teaching at all times when we're awake. So you see, everyone here must take that teaching role seriously. And Malachi is encouraging us to do that in a couple of ways. Number one, he's saying you should guard your lips and express what is true knowledge of God's word. The apostle Paul would later say, you need to be so studied that you are not a worker who is ashamed. Instead, you are rightly dividing the word of truth. It means you're cutting it straight. You're cutting it right down the middle. This is what God says. We need to be constantly watching what's on our lips. Don't take a break from teaching truth by letting your lips just get flappy (laughs) with untruths. No flapping of the lips of untruths. We are teaching at all times. And then secondly, Malachi says you ought to pursue in your walk with Christ an upright life. You ought to to pursue upright living in peace so that people will have a real example of what it's like to be a Christian. You say, well, Randy, I am not a teacher. I don't know why you're pointing me out. I haven't pointed at you yet, but the Holy Spirit is pointing at you, isn't he? I'm no teacher, you say. Well, teachers are, that responsibility is given to all of us. We are communicating something at all times with our lips and with our life in every moment. But here's here's what the Bible says. You can hear it in the metaphors of the New Testament. You are ambassadors for Christ. To all of us, ambassadors of Christ. You are the light of the world. You are 
disciple makers. You are the letters of Christ to be known and read by all. You are empowered witnesses by the Holy Spirit. You are the aroma of Christ. You are the branches bearing the fruit of Christ. You are the body of Christ. You are the royal priesthood. You are the ministers of reconciliation. You are stewards of grace. You think the Bible is saying that we have impact? That we're teachers with lips and life at all times. I pray that we would know the depth of God's love for us. And in knowing the depth of love that God has for us, we would honor and glory in him, walk in his covenant of life and peace and stand in all of him, living uprightly and guarding our lips at all times that we would speak God's truth and not what is untrue. Ultimately, the spiritual leaders in Malachi's day just failed According to verses 8 and 9, they failed because they did not understand the love of God, the demands of God for their lives. Or if they did understand it, they chose not to walk in it. And they caused others to stumble in word and life. Those priests were disobedient. They were faithless and they were irreverent to God. And God judged them. He made them despised and abased before all people, removing them from their position of honor. Meadowbrook, not taking the name of the Lord seriously brings serious consequences. Dad, not taking the name of God in an honorable and glorious way brings serious consequences to your household. It happens to all of us. When we choose not to honor and glory in God, we are bringing serious consequences, not just to us, but to the people around us. So a disciple who does not embrace the commands of Christ the Lord at best foregoes the blessings in obedience, in obedience to Christ, which is a rich fellowship as a co-minister with him. And at worst, it brings divine judgment. I'm going to encourage all of us in this moment to just take the weightiness of that. And at the same time, recognizing that God has given us an opportunity for a reset, if we'll confess to him, he'll be faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us. If we'll set our mind on the things of the spirit rather than the things of the flesh, the spirit will allow us to have life and peace like we've not been walking in. If we'll understand that God has treasured his word to us and his presence in us so that we might give honor and glory to him and impact at all times in all places people because our lips and our lives are expressing what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If we'll walk in suit of that, my friends, God's great glorious life promised and provided through Jesus Christ will flush in us. And what an impact that can make. Families, friends, neighborhoods, workplaces, schools, churches could be transformed to the glory and the honor of Christ. Let's pray about that. Help us, Lord, in this moment to revere your name as the highest and the greatest that stands above all others over all thrones and dominions and all powers and positions your name stands above them all and may we recognize the heaviness of that truth and may it impact our minds our intentions our words and our actions to the good of our lives and people around us, and most importantly, to the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.